<laughs> Take your seats because we're going to start in a minute. I'm very happy that you all came on this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Um, for some of you who have been here all weekend, um, you probably need some sleep as well, so I'm extra proud that you're here. Um, we're going to start by seeing uh, the movie Neither Allah Nor Master by uh, Nadia Alfani, and she's here as well uh, to talk a little bit further about the film afterwards. Um, we're also going to talk with um, Hint Barrias, Karar Al Asfor, Wissam Sharafardin, I'm sorry, and Sarah Kay, uh, which I will introduce to you uh, later on after the movie. So don't run out of the building because we will have a talk afterwards. Thank you very much and enjoy the film. <laughs> Can I say something about my movie, please? Because it's an uh, old movie. It's uh, eight um, years old. And um, I have to say, because I start the movie uh, before the revolution. And uh, when the movie, uh, when I was editing the movie, the revolution came. So I go back to Tunisia and I shot a lot of pictures of the revolution asking for laicity in, in Tunisia. And so you have two times in the movie. We start with revolution and we make a big flashback with all these images, you know, um, behind the dictatorship with Ben Ali and uh, with the, uh, during the Ramadan in the, in the summer. And after we uh, go back to uh, the present and uh, the revolution. So we will take about that after. Thank you. <laughs> Have a seat. The microphones are coming, but I, I will announce uh, the speakers um, and maybe we get some more public as well. Uh, so Hint Barrios uh, can also come sit with us uh, if she's already here and Wissam Sharafardine. He's an educator and an ex-imam. Um, he was born in the United Arab Emirates uh, from Lebanese parents. Um, he did a lot of research on Islam and revolution because he was, of course, an imam. Um, but now he co-founded also an organization called Muslimish that supports dialogues among ex-Muslims. And he also co-founded an Arab American Center for Culture and Art Studies. Um, Zara Kay, is she here also? Yes! Um, she's also going to sit with us. She is a Tani Tanzanian ex-Muslim activist. Um, she's based in Australia and she also founded Faithless Hijabi. Uh, that's a platform to enable ex-Muslim women to share their stories as well. Um, so have a seat with us. Um, and the last one I want to call is Karar Al Asfor. He's the co-founder of the Atheist Alliance Middle East and North Africa. He's also active with Arab Atheists and the Forum of Humanitarian Dialogue. That's a Facebook uh, discussion group with a lot of members. Oh, please could you sit over there? Um, and Hint, are you here as well? No Hint? Well, we wait for her to come, no worries. Um, so please help yourself to some water um, because it was quite an intense film. It was really beautiful. Um, and I want to start with asking uh, Nadia that you made this film in 2010. You already uh, at the beginning mentioned that. Um, it was before the Arab Revolution. Um, why did you want to make that film in that particular moment? Because at that moment, uh, democratic people in Tunisia um, wants to attack Ben Ali, you know, uh, 
by the way of the laicity, you know, he's, because he said he's democratic and, uh, and uh, he was always uh, saying to the world that, you know, he's uh, against Islamism and everything. So I wanted to demonstrate that uh, he was playing with religion, you know, and um, making all this uh, instrumentalization, you know, with religion and uh, how... Um, there is no law, as, as I say yesterday uh, in Tunisia, who forbidden, you know, to to don't fast during Ramadan. But he obliged all the restaurant and coffee to be all covered of, or closed, you know. Yeah, so, um, in theory, Tunisia is a secular country, but in practice, it's different. No, no, it's not in theory a secular. Uh, it, I don't use secular. <laughs> Laicite. Yeah, because and I, it's strange because I. Uh, um, the the um, subtitles are, are, are you know yeah, it's translated with secularism because laicity doesn't exist the word in in English so I think we have to use it you know to uh, yeah but I think in Dutch we know the word as well right laicite that's a sort of a you know in Dutch yeah okay. yeah also in Italian in Spain in uh, you know in Spanish and uh, we in Tunisia we translate it as laikia because in Arabic they said almania it's not the same you know and uh, it's i think everybody is afraid about this system you know separate it's easy to understand we want to separate the state and the religion you know the religion has nothing to do with the civil law you know and we if we want to be democratic you know we don't have to refer to religion, you know, because this is a choice of everybody. If you choose to be uh, um, religious, it's your problem. It's not a political problem. It's not a society problem. And a lot of people, when you ask in a film, uh, why is it prohibited to eat or why is it prohibited to do this? They, they all refer to Article 1. Um, yeah. And what, what says that? What is that? This Article 1, it's uh, in... Ve in, in um, it was Borgiba, you know, when he took the independence in Tunisia, he, he made this uh, constitution. And in Tunisia, it's the only state in the Arab world or Muslim world, not including Turkey, uh, that uh, we are not a Muslim state. It's not written like this in our constitution. Also in 57, you know. And uh, after the revolution, when we made an, a new constitution, it was a big fight between uh, the Democrats and the, the Islamists with this first article. He said, Tunisia, it's a free country, independent country, and uh, her religion is uh, um, Islam, he, her language Arabic, and the regime is Republic. And now they said, you know, Tunisia, it's a free country, and uh, her religion is Islam, and the, the judge changed, you know. The, the, <laughs> but the, is there a sort of contradiction in that sentence? It's a free country, its religion is Islam? Is that a... Not free country, it means independent. It's because it was, yeah. you know, yeah. it's souverain, souverain yeah. in French, I don't know. In a, and uh, But, you know, it's... It's something very uh, amb ambigu, ambigu mm -hmm. yeah, yes. ambiguous, because it means the, st the religion of the, the country. And for Bogiba, it's not the religion of the state. And uh, for him, you know, he, uh, he was really convinced by laicité. And uh, some of people said that he is a uh, uh, franc-maçon uh, in Tunisia. And, uh, I think yes, because I remember my when I was a child in Tunisia, you know, during Ramadan, uh, the, the 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 coffee, the restaurant are open. There are no uh, particularly, um, um, you know, we don't stop working because it's uh, the the end of the day and to, to go to eat. And and the imam was, was also not on television in that time. Yeah. And not the the call to the prior, you yeah. know, because it was Ben Ali who who made this. And uh, but I think you know in Tunisia, all we still are particularly uh, country, you know, in this area. But we 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 are also you know gained by 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 this uh, Muslim. Uh, and I th I think it's also. Uh, pff, 
geopolitical yeah. problem, you know. Mm. Yeah, I want to ask something uh, uh, to you, Hint, because Morocco was also uh, in the film, uh, the picnic protest, and um, it, you talked a little bit about the similarities and the differences, and I want to know, did you recognize a lot of your country uh, about Tunisia as well? It's, it's working, you don't have to do anything, just talk. Um. Well, there are actually many similarities between Tunisia and Morocco. Uh, we have some like differences. Um, they are lucky not to have a law that prohibits um, uh, not fasting publicly, but in Morocco there is a law that pa uh, that punish pe uh, um, people who uh, eat, during, drink, smoke, or whatever, uh, during uh, the day in Ramadan. And what, what is strange, actually, and is that the French uh, who imposed this law oh, really? in Morocco, That's it's not Morocco, it, yeah, it wasn't by Moroccans, it was uh, during uh, colonialism. And do you know why they did that? Why? Because there was a Jewish, a big Jewish community, they were, like uh, Les Pieds Noirs, I mean French people who, who, um, who, moved. who lived in, uh, in, in Morocco. So yeah. they just, you know, there was a segregation. This is for Muslims, this is for Jews. Christians, yeah. this is for, um, for um, Christians. Okay, and there are uh, actually other things that separate. For example, in swimming pools, uh, the French imposed laws that, for example, this day is for, for Jewish people, this one is for the Muslims, and the other one for Christians. So, and actually there are many, many laws that were imposed by the French, and they still exist. And they made the separation even bigger between the groups, I No, in the swimming pool, uh, in the swimming pools, it doesn't exist, but in some laws, like for the punishment of, um, like, um, for gay people, it's, it's by law, and it's the French also who imposed that. It's not Moroccans. Because in our Moroccan cal uh, culture, we are like, in some regions, they are gay friendly, historically speaking. But in, um, in the law, um, it's prohibited. And there's also something else, like for, you, you, you go to the mosques and you find that it's forbidden for uh, non-Muslims to, to enter the to mosques. Ask. And uh, this is uh, something strange, but the French imposed it. So we still have some French laws that still work in. That yeah. make this happen, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, to you, um, because the film is also about the, the social pressure, um, whether it's in the law or not, uh, the social pressure to, to engage and to even pretend that you're uh, also engaging in the Ramadan, for instance, um, is really high. Did, do you recognize that as well? It, did you also feel that? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's very um, uh, strange, and the contradictions are depicted beautifully in the in the film, uh, because you'll find in a lot of uh, spaces, uh, majority, uh, for example, do not fast, yet everyone pretends that they're fasting, and you wonder what's that. Uh, what, what are you afraid of? You're the majority, even in the West. So I come from a city uh, that is known to be uh, one of the highest concentrations of, uh, of Arabs and Muslims outside the Middle East, which is the city of Dearborn, Michigan, in the United States. And uh, even it's a completely secular country to a certain extent, and it's a free society, but yet because of the pressure of the Muslim community, people uh, are still they act like you are in an Islamic country because of the social pressures. Uh, so it it's always has estranged me how uh, these uh, the diactomies and these contradictions. Uh, for example, uh, when, we, when Muslims get angry at uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad cartoons, uh, it has the same blasphemous value in Islam as cartoons of any prophet. But they don't get angry at that, they get angry at, at this. And the same thing with prayer is considered more important than fasting in Islam, but yet they don't get uh, sensitive about prayer, but they get sensitive. Of, and that tells you how culture takes over and, and collective psychology takes over religion sometimes. Yeah, because it was also in the film with the five pillars, I think, and that uh, one, they make one more important than the other. 
because it's the culture. But you're also, of course, an ex-imam. Um, were you, when you were an imam, were you also applying that social pressure to other people? Yeah, I mean, um, you are in a, um, so uh, within Islam, you are, uh, you, you have these values and the, you, you're living inside this uh, bubble of uh, um, a lot of spiritual connections and, and you live inside that bubble and you don't understand outside of it. Islam in itself is a judge, judgmental religion. I mean, even uh, the, the most recited chapter, Al-Fatiha, the, the first chapter, uh, it's full of judgments. It ends with judging others. Um, and I heard a lecture once by another imam uh, asking people to be judgmental, that you know, you, Islam teaches you how to be judgmental. So I think it applies social, it, it makes society become an authority. Uh, and that authority is very harsh. It makes it uh, almost a mob mentality. It's built into the uh, collective thought of, uh, of Islam, which is very dangerous. Sarah, I saw you laughing a bit. What were you thinking? Um, it was just that, you know, I, I grew up in like not a Muslim majority country. It's mostly Christian majority. But until I was 16, I didn't even know you could be a Muslim and not wear a hijab. And that was only because I left Tanzania and I moved to Malaysia. And I was like, wait, you call yourself a Muslim and you don't wear a hijab? That, that's the thing? So a lot of the culture, what he mentioned, and the society that takes control is very applicable in also countries that are not Muslim majority or states that are not Muslim majority and not enforced. Um, but just on the topic of democracy, um, in Tanzania, we recently, two years ago, elected a uh, democratic dictator, so people voted. It was, a de it was a democracy, but now it's turning into a dictatorship. And laws that are not even being practiced, that weren't being practiced before, like LGBT laws, are now being practiced heavily. And you don't have to be gay to go to jail. I just have to be a supporter, so I could technically go to jail just for having a Facebook post saying that I support the rights of LGBT. Why do you think that changed? Um, I think it's because, well, with Tanzania, and this might also apply to the Middle East, that they're, they're not governed by what's best for the future and for everyone. They're mostly governed by either religious indoctrination, so their laws will be um, around religion, protecting religious rights, and around um, protecting people based on 7th century laws, so homosexuality given all Abrahamic religions condemn it. Um, that's one of the big topics, and people are resisting, but even then, um, it comes at a lot of cost. So I think a lot of times that even if there are people who dissent, they don't come out freely. In my community, I was the first one, and I didn't know anybody who had come out. So I received a lot of backlash, and I was ostracized, and I can't go back home because, and it's, it's, it's not a country that has apostasy or blasphemy laws, but I can't go back home because I've already gotten threats saying, if you come back home, we're gonna post photos of you with crosses so that you're killed. So I had to change my name so nobody knows who my family is. I can't speak against the government, um, even though you know I was gonna go for a protest last year and nobody knew I was there. They had an army there and you couldn't, they had guns. You just couldn't protest against the government. You were not allowed to. That, that seems terrible to me. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's a really <laughs> serious case. Uh, how, how did you deal with being ostracized and uh, moving away from your home country? Um, I, I left at the age of 16 and I stopped praying at 14, but just like how he mentioned, we were pretending to be Muslims. I, I, I didn't believe in God, but I was pretending to be Muslim. Um, I don't fancy Tanzania for a lot of reasons, being the infrastructure and the economy, like economy and the politics, so I'm not a big fan of going back home. It's sad, but my family has been accommodating, so they'll fly here or we'll meet up midway or they'll come, they came to Australia. I'm now London-based, so they'll, they'll fly to London now. But it is really hard because Tanzania has room for a lot of improvement and a lot of change, not just with religion, but even just basic things like education for women is such a battle that I want to go there and make change because that is so dear to me, but I can't do it because 
one, I won't be heard. Two, there is a risk on my life. And it feels, almost feels like an irrational fear. But it just takes one crazy person to go like, all right, you're gone. Um, and Karar, you are the uh, co-founder of the Atheist Alliance Middle East and North Africa. Um, yes. That's a lot of countries. Uh, can you tell something? It, it's just working if you talk to it. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. And I would like to thank you for this opportunity to meet all these infidels. Uh, a little bit about me. I've co-founded the uh, Atheist Alliance uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and I'm also an admin of several, several groups. It consists of uh, several uh, hundred thousands of members. And uh, we succeeded to enlighten uh, many people. Uh, I'm also uh, a rep uh, represent uh, Netherlands-based uh, Nasawiya feminist organization. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so my question, um, when you're uh, doing this Facebook group with all those members, um, what is your goal with that? Why did you found it that? Yes, because uh, there is a misunderstanding, uh, misconception among people uh, about what is atheism, what is secularism. I want to enlighten uh, as much, uh, as many people as possible. And we succeeded in that. We still have many issues to tackle, but at least uh, we, we were able to, uh, to enlighten thousands of people about these subjects. And this is good. Uh, we did it in short time. It's like uh, one or two years. But we have uh, other issues right now, which is um, cyber attacks we are facing. And from who are those cyber attacks coming? From the Islamists. Islamist groups, uh, they, uh, they organize uh, these reporting attacks because, you know, uh, it's, uh, on Facebook there are some rules and they, they just uh, misuse them. And sometimes I believe uh, there is a cooperation with, uh, with the Dubai office uh, of Facebook. Okay. Do, do you, sorry. Yeah. Do you find yourself that your groups are getting banned more than often for not? Like even saying something blasphemous. My my, my groups, uh, two of my groups uh, has been co completely shut down. Uh, it's like uh, 180,000 member, and also even my my private uh, profile. Uh, uh, before one month, I was banned uh, just because for nothing, just because uh, I had already banned several times before, so they banned me again. That's terrible, and you just start over again. Yeah. Every time. Just by the way, we are experiencing the same thing. There is an organized cyber army that keeps uh, blocking uh, and uh, you know, you're reporting us and reporting members and uh, groups. Yes. And this just opens up another avenue of discussion on how social media is taking control over free speech and censorship. And that's terrible because social media is one of the ways that we connect with people from different places going through the same plight. And we're still, being a minority, are suffering from even having our voices heard. And it happens to be one of the very few channels that is effective at the same time. It's being monopolized by mainly one company being Facebook. And they've just taken over Instagram and WhatsApp. And even then we face being banned for just exercising our right. I was, I was banned when I put up a rape threat that I got. And I think Mariam also faced this. And I was like, why am I being banned? Because I put up a screenshot. And yet again, we're being silenced. But you know, the pages who called for my assassination on Facebook in Arabic when I made this movie, I, it, and they post you know, a lot of photo of me, terrible and everything. And uh, it took me two years and a half to ban those pages, you know, because I, 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 I make a charge uh, against it in France, and uh, they said, oh, after six months, they answer from USA, and they said, no, it's, uh, the administrators are not in France, so you have to apply in Tunisia. But I was not, I was not able to go back to Tunisia. 
So it took me two, two years and a half to ban those pages, you know, and it was not one, it was something, and, and they had something like 35,000 likes, you know, from wow. uh, Tunisia, yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. Mm. We, we, we have discussed this uh, because it's becoming a trend that we might get to a point where Facebook is not really a free uh, social platform for us, and we considered having uh, different platforms, uh, private platforms, like uh, through WordPress or something else. Uh, we don't know how much soft power, that was uh, something that was discussed yesterday, yes. how much soft power has uh, infiltrated or has you know, in intimidated uh, the process. Yeah, I think in general that's, that's quite a hard concept now, uh, being with Facebook and Twitter having such great monopolies on, uh, on platform. Um, I just want to go to the room and see if there are any questions for any of these speakers. Uh, please raise your hand and I will come to you with the microphone. Sorry, I'm tweeting as well at the same time. Um, I, I was really moved by uh, Nadia's film because uh, I think uh, a lot of us that come from societies that have become Islamist, uh, we can see uh, the sort of the hypocrisies, the double standards, uh, the state's imposition of, of rules, uh, and this change. You know, you look at images of Tunisia in the 60s, we have the same thing. You look at images of Iran or Afghanistan. And so I wanted you to talk about that political aspect of the Islamization of the region, because um, I know you have a lot of thoughts about it. But also, what, you know, I know you're, you stress laicite, but maybe talk about the alternatives as well, what we can do? Uh, it's difficult, you know, because I think it's, I, I still think it's a political problem, and I, th I still think as a woman, you know, who speaks uh, at the end of the movie, and she said, uh, we don't, what we have to offer, you know, to the people, who, are, who, who saw their lives, you know, broken and, uh, and you know, they, they, they cannot dream for a, a, a better life for their children. And so they just, you know, put their hands, put their life in, in, in religion, you know. I think it's easier that, uh, than to, we have to, demonstrate to these people that it's important to have conviction, conviction, conviction. To, to defend, you know, and uh, when I see how is the left now around the world, you know, I think it's when we, I'm sorry because I, I know a lot of people are not from the, uh, agree with the communism and everything, but I, I think it was really a disaster the, the, the um, how do you say, la, la chute? Uh, collapse. The collapse of USSR. Not for USSR, but for the, for the ideas from the left. Because now, all the people think that uh, capitalism is the best way to live, you know? And I think all the problem is coming from that, you know? From this um, choice of the way to live, you know? We have to just con consume and just, uh, you know, uh, nobody, when I remember when I was young, you know, all the people were engaged, you know? You have some people from this party and the others, and now nobody, nobody are m more engaged, you know? We are just, you know, fighting some, someone for the climate and someone for vegan and someone for... Uh, but there is no more ideology. And I believe we need this, you know, not as a religion, but, you know, to get people together, to fight together, to be together for the... the I remember those two months or three months like a dream uh, just after revolution, you know? You can see on the images, we have women, young, rich, poor, everybody was together on this place, occupied this place, waiting for the, the, the collapse of the government, you know, because Ben Ali was gone, but the government was still here, you know? And everybody was together, and no harassment against women, no, uh, you know? 
everybody was together for one idea, you know, to collapse this government. So we have, we need to dream about something like that. But after, it was, uh, it's complicated. I don't have any solution. I don't, uh, I, I'm just, you know, thinking uh, every day about what's happening to Tunisia. It's so sad. I, I never imagine what happens. It's not me, but my story was, you know, the proof of what is happening in the country, you know, that it's, there is no more tolerances of uh, any uh, different ideas and different way of choose a uh, life and everything. And now it was the democratic people, the Democrats, who ask the right for those fucking Islamists to come back in Tunisia and see what we are now. Because Ranouchi was in, in, in London, you know, for 20 years. But he was condemned in Tunisia for terrorism, for, 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 for death, you know. And, and, and it was the Democrat people who asked him to be um, removed, you know, and to come back to Tunisia and make what he made, you know, with the money of Qatar, you know. But I, I, I have a follow-up question. Do you think one imposed or advocated ideology is still democratic? So, so, so one ideology that you suggested having a ideology that one that people subscribe to. Do you think? No, that's no, I don't want one ideology for everybody. I want people can you know fight for ideas that they they have you know, and a lot of ideas you can you can have a lot of ideology, not only one, but you you know I believe of some principle, yeah. For me, you know, uh, freedom, equality, uh, you know, as, as we, you know, in France, there is a, the, the republic is freedom, equality, and fraternity, it means solidarity. For me, it's, you know, the main, the basis, you know. If we have freedom, equality, but we don't have. No, we don't. Where? In which country we have this? Nowhere, you know. So I think this is the base. It's not uh, obviously communist or everything, but for me, it's a base, base yeah. for, for all the people, you know. We need freedom, we need equality, and we need to be together to fight for our rights, you know. Yes, it's, uh, it's, I think it's... <laughs> I want to ask her. Yeah. Yes, Nadia, thank you. But uh, when we, we say, like, to fight against who? and with who. You see, like the experience of the Iranian revolution, it showed, it's, it's very good experience, it's a historical experience. We know that like when the Islamists came to power, they took everything, they uh, killed people, uh, etc. And now we have the, the experience of Tunisia. Okay, so from the beginning, there were, uh, Islamists were there during the, 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 the Arab Spring, and they weren't there. In Tunisia, no. It was, it, it, During the revolution, the same, yes. there is no one slogan this about it. Allah. It was only freedom, you know, bread, freedom, work, mm -hmm. dignity. Only, never, never in, in demonstration, you can hear Allah is like, uh, uh, Akbar word. Never. It was only after, it was I was filming them, mm -hmm. you know. When they passed, because the people were filming them, you know. Oh. The Islamists. No, you know? in, in Morocco, they weren't there in the beginning yeah. at all. Yeah. They were just like watching and like, let's uh, wait and see. But what is funny uh, is that some leftists who brought them to, to, the, to, to that movement, to the Arab Spring, but uh, just to give hope, it's called Arab Spring, and spring is just, is just a season, so... Uh, you know, there are the four seasons. <laughs> but in I have one in more Iran, question. You know, here. in Iran, the revolution was with the Communist Party. Yeah, and they killed them. Nadia, I appreciate you so much. You said you have no solution, but your solution was already there. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, instead of being so, um, you know, presenting yourself so lost, I can't say passive, because otherwise you're not going to be here, but you are here. But reality is, 
out of all this you know, necessity came out this kind of conferences and this kind of gathering. And the reality is the activists are always activists. Doesn't matter where and where and how, but you've done it. That's the solution. And please continue doing yeah, yeah, that. Of course. I appreciate that. But also as a mom, I ask you, now is your time. Now is your time to do whatever you've done before wrong, to do it right. <laughs> well, when, uh, I'll take this as a question. <laughs> the pressure is on. Yeah, so um, I actually was a reformist within even the Islamic uh, environment, and I continue to be today. I'm still involved uh, supporting reform uh, movements within the Islamic atmosphere. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to work with Muslimish Free Thinking Society and uh, several organizations. Uh, I wanted to uh, continue on that thought is that I think the, the, the most positive thing that came out from the Arab Spring, and I think it's just a beginning, like you said, it's a season, uh, is that the political Islam, the Arab Spring has proved that political Islam cannot be successful. The political Islam has failed in the Arab Spring. You go to the Arabic world today, and they don't want to see any turbans in the government, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in uh, Egypt. And now Tunisia has become a democratic uh, uh, country. Now it's the time for education, so, so the secularism can get the, the majority votes, etc. cetera. Uh, I had a meeting last year with the secular movement in Lebanon. I'm originally from Lebanon. And they had a successful uh, participation in the last election. They had 66 candidates. One of them uh, got into the government. Uh, they were very organized. We have few members of them here in the conference today, actually. Um, and we, we focused on three, because we're talking about solutions. We focused on three points. One is having some sort of a document, a declaration of value that we can refer to, because we need something that is uh, a straightforward and, like she said, an ideology. We need something that we declare our values so we're not ambiguous and we're not, uh, people are not uh, being confused or they cannot fall into conspiracy theory about us. So we need to be clear with a document that can also unite us. So we're not following individuals, we're pointing to a document. And second, we need to uh, stay away from any uh, areas of suspicion because conspiracy theory is a prominent in our areas and they easily accuse us. So stay away from support that is suspicious and try to stay with, the authentic, uh, with our authentic voice. Uh, and the third is to be organized, is to uh, prioritize our, our, our targets because under the ban... No, no, under the banner of secularism and changing society into a secular society presenting... Yes, <laughs> no, it's under the banner of secularism. And actually there are modern reformist Islamists, uh, Muslims and Islamists who are with secular society. We need to uh, bring them to alliance when it's about getting into the government and changing regime. So I say there is an Arab Spring, a second Arab Spring coming. We saw it starting in Sudan. And I feel that the first Arab Spring has, has uh, paved the way uh, for us. And I want to take also the opportunity to say that uh, for, the, for the people of the Netherlands and for the organizers of this conference, Maryam Namazi, etc., cetera, uh, that uh, this country and, and this conference ha has set a model for us. Uh, you have set Netherlands, Amsterdam has set the bar high in terms of the fight for human rights, for progressiveness, for uh, secularism, and continue to do, uh, although you are very high uh, in your achievements, Continue to do what you're doing, because even in America, you are a model for us. We say, look at the Netherlands. They have a high index of happiness. They have uh, this and that achievement, and we look forward to, uh, you know, to achieve things that they have achieved already. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to the next question. Um, you spoke about soft power. I, I actually raised that yesterday. And one of the things I wanted the panel to, uh, to discuss is... Social media is a bit of a paradox because on the one hand it's aided 
a lot of ex-Muslims and human rights supporters look at the Saudi. But in your cases also, you've seen the negative side of that. So what could be done to bring more accountability? Uh, because social media is probably one of the biggest apparatus we can use to defend human rights as well. So I wanted to, you've all had experiences, so I wanted to know your views on that. The problem is uh, Facebook, you know, uh, he's talking with the, you know, the president of the United States and with Macron and uh, he's making, he's going agree with them, you know, and now in France, for example, they discover that uh, all the, the purpose coming from the left and newspaper on Facebook are not related, you know. So the um, algorithm of Facebook, you know, is very manipulated, you know. It's, we are living, you know, uh, 1984 from Orwell, you know, uh, already. So we have to be w aware of that. So we, we have to identify, you know, our enemies and to, to fight against them. So we have to denounce uh, when we find those proof of... Uh, uh, what happened in Facebook, and I don't know, because they have the money, they got the money, we don't have money. We have ideas, we have, you know, solidarity and everything, but we don't have money. And they have a lot, and they are agree, you know, and uh, together. Uh, and Facebook uh, is, you know, uh, with the Islamists, because they pay a lot for their pages. I mean, I, I think there are multiple facets to how social media can be used. One can be very toxic, but there are other ways, which is awareness and advocacy. Just thinking about Rahaf's case earlier this year. That girl's life was saved because she made a noise in Thailand. You know, it came to Australia, it came to Canada. There were multiple people, there was awareness. But what happened after it, when the media was covering it, nobody bothered mentioning, mentioning that she had left Islam. Everybody victimized her for being a Saudi woman. And nobody wanted to talk about being ex-Muslims. It was only early this year when, you know, all of us went like, but she's an ex-Muslim. Like, you're not, nobody wanted to touch that fact. But with social media, we find that we can create that noise. It might not be heard. We have the risk of censorship. But, you know, there are ways to counter it by going around the system and using different words. Not that I am a big fan of it. I, do, I, I, I don't like really beating around the bush. But there are ways that we can use that to change policies by applying more pressure. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. But there, there have been examples that it has worked before. Thank you. We have uh, another question up here. Uh, Nadia, thank you so, uh, so much for uh, making such an amazing film. I was brought up in Iran, and we were forced into fastings. If we didn't fast, so we were put, we were expelled from schools. And you know how it is in in a Islamic states, uh, more harsh than what we saw in this film. And, but one of my real problems is when, uh, since I'm living in the UK and when I have to collaborate with Western uh, uh, feminists or um, those who are working for human rights issues. And um, the problem is that, um, uh, for example, you see politicians coming up and uh, saying uh, mm, uh, they're congratulating Ramadan and uh, kind of giving voice, more, more space to Islamists to practice their religion in the schools under the label of cultural practices. And I think this is, this is a very, very wrong uh, concept, which is giving more space to radical Islamists um, being rooted in the society. I've been in, in London, I've been so many times uh, uh, accused by other Muslims of why you're not fast, fasting. And um, I see this as a big threat uh, when I live in a Western society, which I think under the banner of, um, uh, you know, democratic society, uh, Western uh, 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 activists are failing this issue. So I would like to know your views on this. So I think this brings us back again to the social pressure as well, right? Um, so what can we do against social pressure to uh, behave a certain way or do certain things. Just continue to to live as 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 we want, you know, and to show that we are we are here, you know. 
they know to they have to know that we are here you know we exist but i think uh, excuse me i think yeah. that it has something to do with the ghettos for example if you go to france you find neighborhoods but like all moroccan uh, people okay then you go somewhere else you find turkish this is a community this is like a ghetto so you, if you you are a poor woman, you cannot leave, uh, you are a free one, you cannot leave outside, you cannot leave in, um, yeah. uh, uh, like, anonymous. So you the are, segregation in yeah. cities also makes So you find yourself, you find closed. yourself in a community, and you cannot live in a community differently, and be different at the same time. And I think it ha this has something to do with the, the previous politics of some European countries. Yeah, so uh, also the housing the policies. The communities yeah. and the, the schools, uh, yeah. private schools, for, for instance, in uh, England, or what do you call it now, uh, like the capital is London East End. So, it, yes, it, it's, it's true. So it, it's strange when I hear uh, uh, a woman who says that uh, she, she cannot wear what she wants um, um, in, in London, this is um, this is uh, strange. This is sometimes strange. Uh, yes. But in, in Morocco, which is an African country and a Muslim one, uh, you you can you, you can do it. No, but in in, in the, the 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 big cities, um, you are anonymous, so nobody will talk to you. Yeah. You, you just if someone talks to you, you f you fight. You you can you you know you yeah. you react in your way. So yeah, I so think it has to, something to do with the politics, yeah. with the European politics towards uh, yeah. different people. I'll give you the last word and then we have yeah. to close up. Yeah. Uh, can I just, uh, just gonna add to Nadia's point? Yeah, you just have to keep doing it. I mean, how many people here have been called a racist when they speak about Islam? I have, I, I'm, the, I'm the same race. Have we been called an Islamophobe? Yeah, what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna stop? Are you gonna stop? Are you gonna let people stop you? You just have to keep going. As long as you know you're true and you know what you're fighting for, you need to keep doing it. And yes, that will come at a lot of backlash, but slavery wasn't abolished, and it still hasn't been, because we were silent. You know, bad practices are not going to be abolished because we're silent and we succumb to it. We must fight these ideas, we must keep going, and I understand the social pressure and the social isolation, but we must keep doing these things to then try creating change, if not policies, or if they're, especially if they're not struck, like governed by, or um, sorry, if, if they're not imposed by the government, we need to start fighting the social stigma and change the social systems. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you for being here.